Father, we're glad that you allow us to be yours. We thank you for inviting us. Inviting us to come to you. Thank you for what Jesus Christ did. Almost 2,000 years ago when he went to Calvary, took our place, died on a cross willingly, and yielded up the ghost in order that we might have access into the Holy of Holies. Father, we come today to worship you. It's all about you. Thank you for the singing. Thank you for the opportunity to fellowship. Thank you for the opportunity to give of our tithes and our offerings. But thank you, Father, for the time that we open the very Word of God and allow it to address us. Today, Father, we, 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 we thank you for, for the privilege to be back in your house. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let me ask you, can you see the screens all right from back there with the lighting? Yes or no? You okay? Okay, because I was going to ask for a number four on the lighting maybe to lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, turning your Bible, if you will, today to Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter. We're going to be looking at the 50th through the 54th verse. A couple of weeks ago, I, I was preparing for a message, and I realized something that, that I am guilty of doing. And one of the things is that the crucifixion, the trial of the crucifixion, and the resurrection, I always use those around Easter time and, and not the rest of the year. But I got to thinking that this is where it all began for us. Amen. It all began when Jesus Christ aborted a donkey and rode into Jerusalem to give himself up to be that sacrifice. It continued as he went through mockery trials and then on Friday, went to Calvary and died on a cross, was buried, and then three days later rose again. That really began it all. But one passage of Scripture, and it's the passage that we're using today, reminds us that something else took place that I have mentioned a few times, but never really uh, tarried in it. And that's what I want us to do today, and it is the passage that we're reading. So open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter. And we're going to begin reading uh, at the 50th verse, reading only four verses. The 50th verse of the 27th chapter says this, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. When he had cried again, he's on the cross now. He was uh, nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. on that Friday morning. And then uh, he gave up the ghost. He died. He yielded up his life at 3 p.m. in the evening, and that was the same time that the sacrificial lamb for the atonement of the sins of the people were to take place in the temple. And that was only once a year, and only the high priest could go in. So let's pick up at the 51st verse. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth did shake, and the rocks did break, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the grave after his, Jesus' resurrection, and went into the city, and appeared unto many. Now the centurion, and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done... They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. But something happened on that day that was very amazing. I've titled the message, The Three Miraculous Signs, but I subtitled it, Wow. Wow. Torn for me? That's exactly what happened. The veil that separated... The, the Ark of the Covenant and where God was supposed to have dwelt 
It separated that from every person except one person, and that was a high priest. And he could only go in one time a year into the holiest of holies and offer the blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. That was, that veil, it, it, it kept us from God. It didn't allow us to approach God. But what happened, what happened to here was that veil was torn. And it's interesting to note that it was torn from top to bottom. Let me tell you why. Scholars tell us that that veil was a very expensive veil. It had cherubims embroidered on the front of it. They were the guardians that, that also run Adam and Eve out, and, out of the Garden of Eden and then set up to where they could not return. That was a symbol of God's protecting His territory. But then it was torn from the top and it, it was 60 feet high, scholars tell us, so that man could not tear it. It was God's doing, and it was opening up the veil, and it was saying to us, here I am. Because of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, now you have access to the Holy of Holies. That's why that I had to back up and say, wow, he tore it for me. And he tore it for you, my friends, that we might... Finite individuals might have access to a, fi to a infinite, infinite individual might have access to God. That's why I tore it. Because of Jesus. And when we approach God, we approach him with the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to get into that a little bit as we move on down into our text. So let me just share a couple of things here that I've already, already highlighted on a little bit. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Jesus was not killed by the people. He was not killed by the people or by the authorities. He gave up his life. He gave up his life in order that you and I might have access into the Holy of Holies where God dwells. So that holy of holies now is no longer on the earth. It's in heaven. And we can approach God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why it was so much, uh, so many questions of why we pray in Jesus' name? It is simply because it is in Jesus' name. It is because of his sacrifice. It is because of his blood sacrifice that we are able to approach God. God. So we pray in Jesus name. It's kind of like, and I think I had this a little later in my sermon, but I think that this is a good place to use it. Back when I was growing up, and I may have used this illustration here before, but back when I was growing up, or at least growing up to here, my, they were out in the country, were isolated, and neighbors wasn't always right next door. They may be a quarter of a mile, a half a mile away. Grocery stores was always in town, and it wasn't out in the country. We had the country stores, and you would go out and, and buy specialty items, milk, whatever, bread, things like that. But the grocery stores were a long ways away. And every now and again, the wife, a mom in this case, would run out of something that she needed or thought she needed when she was baking. And what she would do would send one of the children over to the neighbors to borrow something and that wasn't unusual. They would bar, and then when, when she got groceries, then she would buy some extra, and she would pay the neighbor back. But I remember when she would send me, when I was the one that would go to the neighbor, I would always walk up to the door, knock on the door, the neighbor would come to the door, and the first thing I would say was, Mama sent me. Mama sent me. And then I tell her what she sent me for, to get whatever to uh, help her to finish her baking. This is exactly what is happening here. When the veil was torn, allowing us to approach God through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can tell him that Jesus sent me. That Jesus sent me. And therefore, he's always ready to, add to, to, to listen to what 
we have to say. Whenever I said mama sent me, the lady, if she had whatever we were needing, would go and get it. No further questions. No further questions now. When you and I can approach a holy God, can approach a holy God and, and give our desires or ask or whatever, ask him for whatever we're needing, God is there to listen to us. And listen to me, when we ask him for what we need, may not be what he knows we need, and that's what he's going to give us. What he knows that we need to allow us to be a better, a better, a stronger child of God. So Jesus yielded up his life. And in John 10, 17, he reminded us again that I, he said, I lay down my life. So the Romans didn't kill him. The Romans didn't take his life. He yielded his life. He yielded for you and I so that we could say, God, Jesus sent me. I'm here in Jesus' name. And he's going to honor that presence of ours. And then again, John stated these words, No man, no man taketh my life from me. No man taketh my life from me. But I lay it down myself. I have the power, he said. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. And he took it up again uh, at, at, at the resurrection in a resurrected body. And he's still living today in the presence of an awesome God. He's still living today in your heart and my heart through the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. So his life wasn't taken. He yielded up his life. He laid down his life in order that you and I might be able to approach a holy God. Number one, the curtain torn. The curtain was torn. Now, this is on that Friday when Jesus was dying, and this is when he died. At the moment that he died was the same moment once a year that the, that the high priest was allowed to, to kill the sacrificial animal and then carry the blood into the holiest of holies. Only once a year for him. The other people stood without. They stood without. So the curtain was torn when the sacrificial animal gave up his life and that was none other than Jesus Christ. None other than Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were torn as well. And the rocks were torn and a little later on we're talking about the folks coming out of the grave. Often then they were buried in a rock cave and a rock was rolled in front just like that Jesus was buried. And the rocks broke at the shaking of the earth. And the shaking of the earth represented, listen to me, the power of God. It represented the power of God. If God had the power to create as he did, and he did. If God had the power to do that, he has the power to shake it so much that even the rocks cannot stand the power of God. The rocks break up. And we can use the rocks for several illustrations. Number one, when our hearts are sinful and stony and hard, only God through the person of the Holy Spirit can come in and break up that hard heart to where that we can humble ourselves enough to invite Jesus Christ in. And the hard heart also works with Christians, when, when we become hard-hearted against the will of God, the Holy Spirit can come in and break that hard heart and allow us to submit to the very will of God in our lives. So several illustrations are available here in that passage, but the curtain was torn. Number one, the curtain tearing it represents this ceremonial 
dispensation period was over. Dispensation is nothing but a period. We live in the grace dispensation period. And I'm glad that we do. I'm glad that we do. I have made this comment many times that I don't believe I could have survived back in the dispensation of the law, back in the ceremonial dispensation. Because I really don't like ceremonies. I really don't like them. I love for us to come in and worship and let the Holy Spirit stir our hearts and move us in a direction that we know that when we've been in the house of God, that Jesus has been in there with us. We know when we leave the house of God that we have been with Jesus Christ and that should show on our faces whenever we leave the house of God. Remember, the disciples, when they were having such a time with the authorities and one of the authorities, uh, authorities went back and told his people that their faces shined just like they have been with Jesus. My friends, when we come in to worship, if we bring too big a load and don't leave it here at this altar, then our faces doesn't shine when we go out. If we carry out the same problems that we bring in, we have not worshipped. We have not worshipped when we come in the house of God and carry out the same problems that we brought in. We haven't worshipped God. The veil was torn. The ceremonies was over. It was time for a real relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. The barrier between the Jew and the Gentile was no longer. In the temple, there was a place that only Gentiles could go. They couldn't go in any further. And the Gentiles, I remind you again, are any non-Jewish people. That was you and I. There was a time that we sat in the back, wasn't allowed to come forward. There was a time of that, but the curtain was torn when God was telling, when Jesus was telling the people that there's no longer a barrier between people. Between ethnic groups, there's no longer a difference. We're all equal in the eyes of God. I said we're all equal in the eyes of God. And we must never forget that. We must never forget that. We're still talking about the torn curtain. The way to the holy place is now acceptable to us through the blood of Jesus. No wonder I said, wow. No wonder I said, wow, that, that Jesus Christ has said to me, man, come on in. Come on in. You're just as special to God as those high priests were. And the high priest is no longer needed today. Our priest is none other than Jesus Christ. And he's sitting in that holy place at the right hand of the Father as you and I worship today. The curtain was torn. The curtain was torn and that was a big event. It wasn't just a historical event. It was an event for all eternity. It was an event for all eternity, not just a historical event. And then the veil was very suggestive, yet it was very obscure. It obscured, it hid God, the very person that created us, the very person that we were to worship. It hid that. That's why in Jesus' time that that had to come down in order for to be a, dis, a grace dispensation period. And I don't think I need to remind you, but I am anyway. Grace means something that we don't deserve. That we don't deserve. So let me say something that goes against the grain. You can quit working so hard if you're not enjoying it. I mean in the church. You heard it from your pastor first. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, then quit. Then quit. Because we cannot work enough to enhance or impress God. 
We cannot work enough. We cannot attend enough church. We cannot read enough Bible to impress God. Jesus Christ impressed God. He impressed God when he gave his life. When he laid down his life in order that you and I might become, might become, might become the children of God. There is no veil now. Nothing to keep us away. So let me ask you something. When was the last time that you walked into the presence of God? With your hands up, identifying surrender. When was the last time that you had time with God? And no other event would override that. This is your time. This is my time with God. Don't bother me now. Don't bother me now. I'm in the holy place. I'm in the holy place. Some, someone might ask you, well, who allowed you to go there? You tell them, Jesus sent me. Jesus sent me. When was the last time? And you've heard me say this a million times, and if I stay here another year, I'll tell you another million times probably. We are as close to God as we choose to be. We're as close to God as we choose to be. That's why the curtains was torn to allow us to come in. To allow us to come in. I want us to read some scripture that will enhance that. And I, want, I didn't put it up on the board. I want you to turn in your Bibles because hopefully you might want to mark your Bibles in these, in these two uh, instances. Go over into the book of Hebrews, uh, if you will. And, and let's uh, go first to chapter 4, verses 14 and 16. Chapter 4, verses 14 and 16, uh, if I can find it in my scriptures. Hebrews chapter 4. And this is, this, is because, this is because the veil was torn, because it was opened up. The way into the presence of God was opened up for us. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Listen to this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with our feelings, but was in all points tempted like we, and yet without sin. Don't tell me we have to yield to sin. If we had to yield to sin, then the Bible is wrong. Jesus was just like you and I. He had the same thought pattern. That you and I, but he focused upon God. He did God's will. And we, my friends, can do that too. The problems that we have is not because of him. It's because of us. In verse 16, let us therefore boldly, boldly, that means not come walking in and feeling guilty with our heads dropped. Let us come boldly into the presence of God, into the holy of holies. We have that invitation from God to come in, to come into the presence of God. There's been only one person that ever walked on this earth that was perfect. And that was Jesus Christ. No other has ever been perfect. Now let's hop over. Let's hop on over We're in Hebrews to the 10th chapter and read a couple of verses there. And again, I'm hoping that if you'd mark your Bibles, you might want to mark them here and go back to them. Verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brothering and sisters, boldness, boldness again, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Not because we're Baptist. Not because we're Pentecostals. Not because we're Methodists. Not because we are Catholics. Because we come with the blood of Jesus sprinkled on us. 
come into the presence of an awesome, of an awesome God, having therefore boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us. Listen to that. That new way, that dying on the cross, that suffering, that tearing the veil was for you and me. Was for you and me. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Jesus Christ opened up the way. He opened up the way. So let us never, never get that, that, that Jesus did what he did on Friday, on Saturday, on, on, my, on Sunday. He did it for us. He did it for us. And then, secondly, we're going to move very quickly with these two, the rock split. And the whole veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth did quake and shake. This was, was the rocks were shaking. Some, some say that maybe this was rolling the stones away in front of the graves that these people were going to come out of on Sunday morning and walk around. That could be it. But let me tell you something. I don't think we're going to need the graves open for us to come out at the resurrection time. I think we're just coming out. How do I, where do I get my information? Because Jesus became the first fruits of them that slept or the first fruits of them that died. On that Easter morning, he didn't need the rock rolled away for him to come out. He was out when the rock was rolled away so the women could see inside that the body was no longer in there. So, so the, a little later on, uh, the, the dead, uh, many of the dead came out of the grave. And uh, thirdly, and very quickly, the dead raised. The dead were raised. And the graves were open. And many bodies, many bodies came out of the grave. The saints, these were Christian people. You know, there's two resurrections. One is for the Christian, per, Christian people, and that is at the rapture. The other is not until after the thousand year, after the seven year period of trib period, and then after the thousand year reign here on earth. That is the next resurrection, and that is a resurrection of the dead, the lost, those that are not going into heaven. But they are resurrected and stand before God as well. But these are Christians. We are told who they were and don't need to know. But they come out of the grave. Sleep simply means those that are dead when we read that scripture uh, in the Bible. And this is where some folks get, uh, get that when we die, we sleep until we're resurrected. I don't think the Bible is saying that at all. At least I haven't been able to find it. Why do I say that? Because Jesus Christ, again, became the first fruits and he didn't sleep in the grave. He was busy while he was in the grave and he came out and he was alive all of the time. Not just some of the time. He was alive all of that time when he came out. Now let's close here with a couple of things that, uh, that is very interesting, I think. The dead raised, and let's move on from that, came out after, yeah, I just want to emphasize that. They came out after his resurrection. After whose resurrection? After Jesus Christ. So don't ever think the dead, when the curtains rip and the earth shake on that Friday, that the dead came out and walked around in town to people. They did not, because Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. They arose on that same day that Jesus arose. So when Jesus was visiting his disciples and letting them know that, that this had taken place, there were these folks that had arisen, uh, uh, the saints that had arisen was walking around in Jerusalem and letting the people know that something big has taken place. Something big has taken place and that, that was Jesus Christ himself had risen. And then the veil torn. I wanted to ask the question here and why was the veil torn? Well, I hope we've covered some of that, but I just want to place some emphasis on it. Now, Brittany Mose, Moss, uh, I found a place on the uh, net last week where she was putting up some sayings, and I don't know whether it was, uh, was, was whatever we do, the gossip column, what is that? Uh, Facebook, yeah. It may have been that. I'm not sure where I found it. But these were, these were really good. And I thought they fit very well here. So if I ask the question, why was the veil torn? And here's one of the reasons. 
Sin always makes a person less than God created them to be. Sin always makes us less than God created us to be. And then there's difference, there is a difference between what we settle for in life and what we are meant for. God created us for a purpose. Sometimes we settle for something that is entirely different from what God created us to be. Why was the veil torn? When we pray to God now, we approach Him in the holiest of holies. When we pray to God, we are not praying, listen to me, I love this. We are not praying for a solution. We are praying to the solution. We are talking to the solution. We are not praying for one. We are talking to one. To the only one that can make us what God created us to be. When we read our Bible, and, and these, these are copied sayings. When we read our Bible, don't just read. Climb inside and live there for a while. Woo! Climb inside the book. And live there for a while. Sometimes our devotions, even mine. Well, I say mine, maybe not yours. Maybe I should kind of retract that a little bit. It's so hurried that I get in the book and I'll do some reading. And as soon as I finish reading, I close it. No. The veil is torn. Get inside the holy place and just live there for a while. God doesn't cause us to uh, cause your, God doesn't consider our past to determine our future. Sometimes we let our past dictate who we are. But God doesn't do that. At any given moment, we have the opportunity to decide, this is not how I'm going to live the rest of my life. I got a feeling all of us have been there at some point or another. God's grace says no matter where you are, I'm not going to give up on you. Mm. No matter where you are in your life, God says, I'm not going to give up on you. And you know what was evidence of that? When Jesus was hanging on that cross, suffering to the time that he thought God had forsaken him, when he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? He could have come down, but he didn't. He stayed there. He stayed there. God's grace is going to seek you out. God's grace is going to seek you out. Seek us out wherever we are. And then we decide whether or not we're going to yield or not. When something bad happens in our lives, we have three choices. Now listen to this. I'm still copying the moss stuff. Listen to this. We can do one of three things. One, we can let it define us. We can let it define who we are. And it will keep us there for the rest of our lives. Or number two, we can let it destroy us. And that's what happens when we let it define us. It'll eventually destroy us. No walking on the back of the benches now. Number three, we can let it strengthen us. Make us stronger. Make us stronger because we have spent time in the holy place. Again, I ask you, when was the last time you went in and stayed a while? Father, thank you again. Thank you for something that happened almost 2,000 years ago that happened because we are living here in the 21st century. It happened for us. Thank you for tearing that veil and allowing us to go into the presence of an awesome God and just saying, Jesus sent me. Father, I don't know the hearts of the people that are in the house today. You do. You know what we need. You know what we need. And that's all that matters. May we allow you May we allow you to fix us. To fix us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before we get started, is have you ever owned anything or possessed anything of value that you didn't know about? 
You may have found it laying around the house, or maybe you just stumbled upon it, and, and, it, it was, and, and you found out that it was very valuable. Have you ever stumbled upon something like that? Well, I read a story um, this week. It's called Four Bucks, and because four bucks was all it took for this individual. 